I am Dr. Astara Arant. I am a postdoc at the uh, Geniza Research Unit in Cambridge. And um, this is our first meeting of the Oxford Interfaith Forum for this academic year. And we are delighted to have um, Professor Gary Rensberg um, here to speak. Um, Professor Rensberg serves as a Blanche and Irving Laurie Chair in Jewish History and is Distinguished Professor in the Department of Jewish Studies at Rutgers in New Jersey. Um, he says that his teaching and research focuses on all things ancient Israel, and therefore he's the author of seven books and more than 200 articles, which is very impressive. Um, his most recent book is How the Bible is Written, um, and he teaches courses such as on the Book of Genesis and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, relevant for the talk today is he has done extensive research on medieval Hebrew manuscripts at leading libraries, including the Bodleian Library at Oxford, the Cambridge University Library, Vatican Library, the Fisher Library, and the Library of Congress in Washington. Um, he's also been the visiting professor at, at many prestigious universities, including Oxford, Cambridge, Sydney, the Hebrew University, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and so forth. His This semester, he's serving as visiting professor at Bar Ilan, um, and he is living in Jerusalem at the moment this year. So we're very, very honored and excited to hear him talk today. Um, and um, without further ado, Gary, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Estara. Let me... There we go. Uh, thank you first to Taya for the invitation to uh, speak this evening, which is to say good evening from Israel, Europe, and the UK, and uh, good day for those of you who are joining us in North America. So thank you, Taya, for the introduction, for the invitation, and thank you, Estara, uh, for hosting and for uh, the uh, lovely introduction. It's just so wonderful. Uh, that we can be from all over the world and uh, use the great Zoom technology to share the ancient uh, uh, via the modern. Uh, the Kennecott Bible, the greatest Bible ever written. I should say that normally I come to you, as Estara said, from uh, our home in central New Jersey, not far from the Rutgers University campus, but you see if the uh, scene behind me looks very Yerushalmi, that's because, yes, we are in Jerusalem, in our Jerusalem apartment. So um doing uh what we do which is travel the world uh teach at other universities explore archaeological sites historical sites and all the rest the kennecott bible the greatest bible ever written officially known as bodleian kennecott manuscript number one written in la coruña in far northwestern spain in 1476 and you see already one of the pages right here which we will come back to uh, in just a few moments. So those are the basics, uh, which I just uh, stated for you. And we're going to trace its history, its composition, what makes it so special, so unique, and uh, bring it all, bring our story um, uh, up to the very, very uh, present as well. Now, um, before you get to the biblical text, this is the biblical text, and you'll notice Genesis chapter 1, it's folio 9v, 9 versa. But before you get there, the manuscript actually begins, uh, by the way, on the bottom text box there, you'll see 2R hyphen 1V. You're supposed to read that right to left, okay? So you're looking, I'm reading Hebrew here, right? 1V on the right, 1 verso, uh, 2 recto on the left. Before you get to the biblical text, the first eight pages are the grammatical treatise written by uh, the great Provencal uh, Hebraist, uh, David Kimchi, Sefer Michlol. Uh, this is not unique to the Kennecott Bible. Other medieval manuscripts do this as well. Uh, the notion presumably is that before you can even read the first letter of the Torah, before you get to the word Bereshit, you have to know about Hebrew grammar. And you do that through the great introduction to that subject by David Kimchi. So that gets incorporated into the uh, Kennecott Bible at the start. And you see the beautiful artwork, and we're going to come back and talk about this towards the end, and the Hebrew text here uh, of, of, um, of Kimchi and his grammar. And then eventually you reach Folio 9v Verso. Uh, for those of you who are new to 
uh, medieval Hebrew manuscripts or medieval manuscripts generally, we don't count pages so much, we count folios, and a folio has a recto and a verso. So this manuscript has circa 450 uh, folios, which would be the equivalent of 900 pages the way we count in English or uh, French or German or Hebrew uh, today. So here you have the beginning of the biblical text, the large letter bet, uh, in the upper right here to start you off with the word uh, Bereshit. So there you have the uh, opening of, of the entire biblical text. Dimensions for you, uh, 27 and a half centimeters high, 22 and a half centimeters uh, wide. I will show you a few pictures of the actual book uh, with myself in it in, in the photo so you'll get a sense of how it looks. Uh, this is the book this is the manuscript in its box at the Bodleian Library, opened up to one of its pages, which we'll look at later. So you get a sense of, you know, the width or the, the you know, the sort of the hulk, if I can use that word, of what a 450 folio, 900 page manuscript uh, looks like with ample margins and so on, as you see here. Now, uh, what makes the Kennegat Bible so remarkable? First of all, the scribe, our Hebrew scribe, is meticulous and i will give you his name at the end and i'll also talk about the artist at the end but before we get to that let's just look at how beautiful the hebrew text is written it is aligned every word is so perfect and our single scribe is responsible for the hebrew text that you see here obviously right justified because hebrew is written right to left but absolutely every line is perfectly left justified uh, as well. And then there is the exquisite artwork of the Kennecott Bible. Uh, every parasha, this is a complete Bible, by the way, right, from Genesis to the end, but in the Torah, every parasha is introduced by some special artwork, which may or may not have anything to do, as we'll see, with the subject at hand. In this case, most likely, yes, this is Parashat Noah, the second parasha of the, of the Torah, and the animals, male and female, go into the ark. So presumably that's what you're getting an attempt at here at the bottom with the male and female of whatever species of feline this is supposed to be. Uh, almost all of these parasha indicators have the abbreviation, either Peresh or more frequently Peresh Shin, not a complete Shin, uh, for the word parasha. And I also want to highlight that with, un, within the Reish, as you see here, the uh, artist has enumerated the parashot, all 54 of them. So this is the second parasha of the Torah, and therefore there's a letter bet with a dot over it. And you'll see as we move along that this is how you keep track. This is the second uh, weekly reading in the annual lectionary uh, of Jewish tradition. So here we are, I skipped over one, so here we are, parasha. You see the page on the left. This is the fourth parasha, Vayera, of the Torah. And so you, again, you see close up here the Dalad with a dot under it to tell, over it to tell you this is the fourth one. And you get these fantastical creatures that you see here, you know, nothing to do with the story of Abraham, which is what we're reading about at this point in the book of Genesis. Uh, similarly here, Parashat Chaye Sarah, look at this bird. Birds are not mentioned anywhere in that section of uh, Genesis beginning in chapter 23, but you have this bird and again the indication that this is the fifth parasha of the Torah with the letter He. And on it goes, the sixth one, the seventh one, I hope you're all enjoying this beautiful artwork, look at this creature, uh, some sort of uh, bird, obviously. And uh, you continue this way. Here is the beginning of Parashat Miketz. In this case, the scribe did not indicate which parasha this is. And in fact, he doesn't do pei reish shin, he only does a pei and a reish. And in this case, does the pei and the reish, not by writing out the letters, but by what we call zoomorphic and anthropomorphic creatures, which form the letter pei and form the letter reish, and we'll come back to that. This is the first place where he does not indicate which parasha number this is in the weekly cycle of reading the Torah. But I have a theory about this one, but it has to have an asterisk. And that is at the top of this artwork, you see the dog and the dog is shaped like the letter Yod, 
representing 10. And I think, and this is the 10th parasha. So I think Miketz is intentionally introduced this time, not by just writing the Hebrew letter with a dot, but incorporating into the artwork to give us the dog looking like the letter Yod. I said, this is my little pet theory, no pun intended, with the dog with an asterisk, because there are a few other places in the 54 parashot where there's also not a number. So I can't say that this is 100% carried through. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this was the only one that didn't have such a number, uh, except the artwork gives you the number, but we'll leave it at that and uh, allow me in my little fantasy world here that the artist intended the dog to indicate the letter Yod for the 10th parasha. And on and on it goes. Sometimes there are no indications at all. Here's another one. Doesn't even tell you that it's the beginning of a parasha. There's no pay resh or pay resh shin, but a fantastical creature here introducing uh, parashat shalach lecha in uh, the book of Numbers. And similarly here uh, for Korach, where the artwork may be indicating something to do with the personage of Korach, but again, no indication per se that you have the beginning of a new weekly uh, reading um, portion. And every book of the Torah has its beautiful artwork as well to indicate you've reached the end. This is the end of the book of Genesis, and it gives you here in the box the um, typical Masoretic note telling you how many verses there are to the uh, book of Genesis. When you get into the book of Exodus, I just want to share with you some of the highlights. We could spend, you know, hours, you could spend a semester teaching just this one manuscript. When you get into the book of Exodus and you're reading Exodus chapter 14, all of a sudden, instead of the columns of text only on the page, you have additional artwork separating the two columns, which evoke to my eye, I'm not an art historian, I deal with biblical texts, but to my eye, they, these, this art evokes the wall or the walls, recalling that in chapter 14 of Exodus, twice the biblical text says, and the water was unto them like a wall to their right and to their left. And I think that that's what the artist has tried to indicate here for you. Um, when you get to Shirat Hayam, the Song of the Sea, as with all manuscripts, it's laid out in typical poetic structure. Um, according to the scribal tradition, there are various ways of writing the end of the, um, of the Song of the Sea. And I just want to highlight the line that you see here, the last of the lines. Uh, by the way, look at the micrography here for the Masoretic Notes. Every one of these things would be the topic of a dissertation. I am not exaggerating, but I want to focus on the very last line of the song. And this is not unique to the Kennecott Bible, but I do want to show you this. Uh, it occurs in other biblical manuscripts. It occurs in codices. It occurs in Torah scrolls as well. And what you have here is the word Hayam on the right, the sea, and the word Hayam on the left, the sea. And in the middle, Uvnei Yisrael halchu b'yabasha b'toch, and the children of Israel walk through on the dry land in the midst of, and you get a visual effect of the children of Israel marching on dry land in the midst of the sea with the waters to their left and the waters to their right, indicated by the words Hayam. All the wonders that go into the creation of a medieval Hebrew manuscript. I repeat, this is not unique to the Kennecott Bible, but I thought I would show it to you nonetheless. He tisa in the book of Exodus. Everybody like the crown? Uh, this is the crown of Castile. Remember that this is written during the time of the kingdom of Castile in, um, in northern Spain. Here is the coat of arms of Castile, and you can see the sort of the palace structure in the, co in the coat of arms, and also indicated here at the beginning of the parasha of Kitisa. And again, you can note this is the 21st parasha of the Torah and the scribe, artist rather in this case, has indicated that for you uh, right there. Uh, sometimes the uh, coloration bleeds through to the other side. We are looking at the recto here, 74R, and we're going to turn the page so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, this is 74V, so you see the bear and the wolf, 
And again, indication of the 33rd parasha of the Torah, as you begin parashat Bechukotai. And in this case, the artist has in fact used something relevant to the actual biblical text, because in this parasha at the end of the book of Leviticus, you have the admonition that if you do not observe the mitzvot of the Torah, God says, I will send the beasts of the field against you, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the artist uh, knowledgeable in the biblical text uh, has incorporated the bear and uh, the wolf there. Again, an example of where the parasha indicator uh, is re relevant to the, uh, to the actual text. Uh, the law of the so-called red heifer uh, is introduced here, uh, parashat um, uh, chukat, with a picture of the cow. When you get to the parasha of Balak, which is the story of Bil'am, the 40th, look at the left there, the 40th mem plus a dot parasha of the Torah, there is a picture of Bil'am, the prophet Balaam, uh, with an astrolabe. He is seen as a diviner. Uh, there are no astrolabes, of course, in the biblical period, uh, but this is a great medieval instrument used by astronomers and astrologers and so on. Uh, Balaam is seen in the uh, folklore tradition uh, uh, into the Middle Ages of such an individual. And so uh, looking very medieval, of course, with his robe and his shoes, uh, holding the uh, astrolabe in his hand. Uh, those letters which are to be written large, again, the Jewish tradition has various letters of the Torah, which are to be written large, including two in the Shema prayer. So the ayin of the word Shema, and the Dalit of the word Echad. And you can see the extent to which the artist, or first the scribe actually, has written them, and then the artist presumably has gilded them. And yes, this is real gold gilding. And again, the sort of bracketing of the Shema paragraph there uh, as well in Deuteronomy chapter six. Finally, you reach the end of the Torah. Uh, so you see how it ends here on the right, uh, some artwork on the left, but again, the bleeding through of the other side, which has the beautiful menorah that you see here on the right. And then another uh, example of some artwork, folio 121R on the left, which I have not fully studied, but I suspect it has something to do with the tabernacle and the tabernacle accoutrements. I think these are supposed to be the uh, cherubim above the ark, I guess. Um, so again, there's room here for everybody to study something in uh, the Kennecott Bible. Uh, other biblical books, again, um, artwork, uh, bridging books. So here's the end of Judges on the top and the uh, beginning of Samuel on the bottom. When you get to the book of Kings, the start of the book of Kings, uh, it begins with David as an old man. Uh, David is introduced in 1 Kings 1.1 as an old man. And there, of course, is David on the throne looking presumably advanced in years, uh, as you see uh, here. Now, uh, the question is, uh, you know, here is King David, but he's again looking very royal and regal in a medieval style, and he obviously is stylized after a medieval king, in fact, after a medieval Spanish king. The question that we should all be asking is, how would our artist living in La Coruña in far northwestern Spain, I'll show you the map later, he would never have seen the king of, of Spain most likely in his life. How would he know what the robes and throne and so on of the Spanish king looked like? And the answer is, this is not original to me, but as other art historians um, have concluded, uh, from uh, medieval Spanish playing cards. So these are examples of the king on Spanish playing cards. And if you look at the robe, and you see the way the robe is parted here, you see the way the robe is parted here, this club-like structure, club-like thing in his hand, uh, you get a sense that we're looking at somebody who never saw a king, but knew what a king was supposed to look like on the basis of playing cards. I love this part of the Kennecott Bible. Uh, there's my own photo of it. These photos, and almost all the ones I'm showing you, I have taken from the Bodleian website. Obviously, this is fully available at the Bodleian uh, website. As many of you know, more and more 
of the medieval manuscripts are becoming available, not just the Hebrew ones, but uh, Greek, Latin, Arabic, etc. Uh, this is my own photo when I inspected the manuscript personally uh, to give you a sense, a little bit more different coloration perhaps of uh, King David there, one uh, folio 185R. And yes, some librarian at some point has penciled in folio numbers as you see. Uh, so this is uh, how we know what a king looks like. Okay, um, we get to uh, folio 305R. Uh, this is the audience participation portion of our program. If we were all together in real time, I would say to you, which book of the Bible is this? And of course, there's only one book of the Bible uh, with a ship and a big fish. And yes, this is obviously the opening of the book of Jonah. And I absolutely love those uh, mariners, you know, just like on their own chatting away over here, engaged in conversation while poor Jonah down here in the water is being swallowed by the big fish. We can zoom in even more on that. So here's your a visualization of uh, the book of Jonah. And uh, there's the full page again. Uh, when you get to the book of Psalms, every single psalm is introduced by exquisite artwork. So this is Psalm 1, Aleph, Psalm 2, Bet, Psalm 3, Gimel, Psalm 4, Dalit, Hey, uh, Vav, Zion, Chet, and Tet here. You see Psalms 1 through 9, uh, every single one gets a piece of artwork, okay? Two, all 150 of them get this kind of artwork. We could go through as we did with the parashot, I only showed you a handful, same thing here. You wanna study just the artwork for each of the Psalms. If you're an art historian, there's your dissertation waiting for you. Uh, five more Psalms in, the, in Psalm 85 to Psalm 89 with the artwork and the numeration within the artwork. Uh, when you get to Psalm 90, more artwork than you ever could imagine surrounding the prayer of Moses, I've put the text box on the right there, uh, Tefillah le Moshe. This is the only, of the only one of the Psalms which is ascribed to Moses. And look at all the artwork there. Hold that thought, we'll come back to that as well. Uh, the biblical text ends, and then we return, look at the folio numbers here, we're 438 and 441, just to give you two, pass two examples. We return after the biblical text to more of Chimchi's Hebrew grammar, Sefer Michlol. So the whole biblical text uh, is, is, is enveloped by the uh, beginning of the Sefer Michlol, which I showed you at the start of the manuscript. And even after the biblical text concludes, you have towards the end, we're getting close to the end here with folio 441, etc., uh, more of the Sefer Michlo, a grammatical treatise of David Kimchi. Look at the artwork now. Look at this stylization here, these half circles, or in this case, almost complete circles. By the way, more crowns here, as you can see, of Castile. And if you were attentive, you would have seen these in the beginning as well. All of the pages of the Sefer Michlo have this kind of artwork. Where does the artist get this from? So you now go to architecture. Not only am I not an art historian, I'm also not a architectural historian, but of course I have interest in all of this material because it all fits together as we need to incorporate all of this uh, when we look at a crown jewel of medieval Hebrew manuscripts, the Kennecott Bible. This is the synagogue in Toledo. Look at the uh, openings here in the bell tower and you get a sense that this is the same artwork that you see in the manuscript. Let's go inside the synagogue. Here the ark has this kind of artwork but even more importantly the windows at the top which let the light in over here evoking uh, or the other way around the manuscript written at a distance of a century and a half after the construction of the Toledo Synagogue, evoking that kind of artwork. Again, not an, I'm not an art historian, but I'm, I'm sufficiently um, educated to know that we call this the Mudejar art. Mudejar is a term which is used to refer to those Muslims who remained in Christian Spain during the Reconquista, as the Christians in the north continued to push the border southward until the only thing that remained was Granada down to the year 1492. 
the Mudejar were those Muslims who were still living in places like Toledo and so on. And it was those Muslim traditions which affected Christian and Jewish uh, architecture and eventually, as you see in the Kennecott Bible. So when we talk about the overarching theme of our series, which is manuscripts in multi-faith context, uh, this is the best way of illustrating that for you. And again, more of those uh, windows and the designs of those windows, uh, which are then used for uh, the Kennecott Bible. Uh, but not just in the synagogue, uh, also in uh, churches and other buildings around Spain as well. This is one of the great examples of Mudejar art in Spain. This is the bell tower of the Church of San Salvador in uh, Teru Teruel. And again, you see the way the windows or the openings in the bell tower look. This is all built into our manuscript. If you go to the Royal Palace in Sevilla, by the way, this is uh, still owned by the uh, Royal Family of Spain and they have apartments on the um, upper level. So when they are in Sevilla uh, in the south, they actually stay here. Again, look at the windows look at the art, look at the architecture, and hopefully you're able to understand everything that I'm showing you, uh, how all of this filters into the Kennecott Bible. And ditto for the Royal Palace of Evora in Portugal. Again, just look at all of these kinds of architectural features. Hard to see the windows so much on the upper story there, but this portico has the artwork that we're talking about or the architecture that we're talking about. And now I bring you back to the Kennecott Bible where you actually see, right here you have it in architecture, here you have it in art. So Christian, Jewish, and Muslim all um, melding together in the production of this uh, manuscript. I, I wanna make it clear, the manuscript is totally Jewish, but you can see the um, Muslim and Christian influences uh, in various uh, places. Uh, we are now near the end of the grammatical treatise, and I wanna focus on the artwork at the top, but to do that, we're going to have to uh, zoom in and see what we're looking at here. This is the cats, sorry, the rabbits storming the palace, here are the rabbits, with their spears and everything, storming the palace, which is guarded by the dog. And presumably this rabbit is the king and this rabbit is either the queen or a prince or something like that. So here are the rabbits storming the palace. This is a motif which is right out of Christian artwork as I will show you. Uh, here you have examples. This one is in the British Library and you see the artwork of the rabbit shooting the bow and arrow on the top attacking the horse and on the bottom attack, sorry, the dog, and on the bottom attacking also a dog, but a kind of hound of some sort. So this is what you see in Christian art. And our Jewish artist is cognizant of this material. And so he, in, he creates this here uh, at the top of this page in the Kennecott Bible. Let us remember that in the case of the um, artists and scribes, they all worked in the same workshop. They all needed to get the same parchment. They all needed to go to parchment makers. They all needed the same ink. They all needed the same tools. They all needed the same colors and hues. And they could be working side by side. I'm writing my text in Hebrew and you're writing your text in Latin, but they're going to see the influences from one to the other. Uh, I don't think the Jews invented the idea, uh, where would they get such an idea from, of the cats attacking the, the rabbits, I'm sorry, attacking, you'll see why I keep saying cats, the rabbits attacking the palace guarded by the dog, the, they get this because they know from their uh, Christian friends who are doing Christian manuscripts that this is the motif. And so the scribe, the author, the artist of the Kennecott Bible uh, does similarly. Okay, now to our cats, uh, the next page, um, you now have cats storming the palace uh, with uh, uh, their swords and their shields. Uh, the palace now being guarded uh, by mice. So these are the motifs. And again, you won't be surprised to find this in Christian art as well. This is a book of hours in the Harley collection, in the British library. And you see the cat with the bow and arrow on the right, firing arrows at a very small creature, a mouse, a couple of mice there, uh, trying to defend 
uh, the palace. So this is um, built into the system of medieval art and our Jewish artist incorporates it into the Kennecott Bible. Uh, two recent books by Kathleen Walker Michael uh, on cats and dogs in medieval manuscripts, if you want to learn more about this, uh, published by the British Library in the last several years. And there you have once more the scene that I was showing you of the uh, cats attacking the palace guarded by the mice. Can't have medieval anything without some jesters, but of course our jesters aren't going to be human in form. We have a monkey jester on the left and a bear jester on the right. Uh, where do we get those ideas from? Well, by now you can already predict that, of course, in Christian manuscripts, animals play musical instruments as well. Again, a Psalter in Latin, known as the Queen Mary Psalter in uh, the British Library. So these are the influences and the confluences of all of our three religions, in this case, mainly Christian and Jewish, but also some Muslim influence based on the architecture that I showed you uh, earlier. So here we are uh, playing various musical instruments in both traditions. Now, who are the people responsible for the Kennecott Bible? This is the colophon page, folio 438R, and we will zoom in and read the Hebrew text here. And here is our Hebrew text, and let me give you, I'll read it in Hebrew, but let me also give you uh, the English for those of you who want to follow along in the English. Ani Moshe Rabbi Yaakov Ibn Zabara Hasofer. I am Moshe, or Moses, the son of Yaakov, or Jacob, of the Ibn Zabara family Hasofer, the scribe. Skipping a few words. Katafti, follow the bouncing ball. Katafti ve nikadati u masarti ve nehegati ela arba'a ve srim sefarim bakovit sachad. I wrote and I punctuated and I added the Masora and I checked these 24 books in one collection, Bukovit Zachad. The Siamti Yoto, Biyom Rivi'i, and I completed it, I concluded it on a Wednesday, third day of the month of Av, the Jewish uh, calendrical year, which we calculate as 1476 uh, CE. Bekan, uh, Bemata La here in this place, La Corunia. And I strengthened it, probably meaning I bound it with 37 booklets or fascicles. And this is how he tells us about the work that he did. Continuing with the lower half of the colophon, uh, Hanechmad Yitzchak ben Bachor Hayakar, uh, sorry, ben Kavod Hayakar Don Shlomo de Braga. For the delightful young man, Yitzchak, or Isaac, the dear firstborn son. Uh, I take back, it's Bichor, right, uh, ben, ben Bachor, yeah, it is firstborn, ben Bachor Hayakar, uh, the dear firstborn son of Don Shlomo de Braga and then usual blessings about how he should be able to read this text uh, for the remainder of his life and also for his offspring and his um, future descendants as well. And when it says Don Shlomo de Braga, the word Don is written there in Hebrew letters, Dalad Vav Nun. In other words, the Spanish word Don is incorporated into our text, meaning Sir or Mr or Lord or uh, something along those lines. Uh, a complete colophon, as we have here, should give us all the information, and this one fortunately does. It should give us the name of the scribe, uh, the date he concluded the work, where he wrote it, and who is the benefactor. And Mr. Shlomo de Braga is the one who obviously paid our scribe, and our artist will come to him in just a second, uh, to do this work. This is the complete colophon. This is uh, for anybody who works with medieval Hebrew manuscripts, this is what you want. Okay, um, now you know our scribe's name, Moshe ben Yaakov. You go back to Psalm 90, and now you understand why he asked the artist to pay homage to him by creating extra artwork around Psalm 90, the prayer of Moses, 
more so than in any other of the 150 Psalms. So that answers the question earlier, why does Psalm 90 get so much uh, artwork? He left the scribe, left the space, and had the artist uh, uh, create the art that you see in, in front of you here. Again, our um, colophon giving us his name, Moshe. This is where La Coruña is. When I told you it's in the far northwest of Spain, in that little part of Spain known as Galicia, with its own uh, um, Spanish uh, Iberian dialect, in many ways closer to Portuguese than it is to Spanish. This is where it's located. And if we zoom into that corner of Iberia, this is where Braga is. So Don Yitzchak, Don Shlomo de Braga by this point, uh, and his son have moved to La Coruña. It's not that far away. Uh, the one is modern day Portugal giving you a sense of the geography here. Uh, if we go to La Coruña today, I've never been to La Coruña, but if we go to La Coruña today, uh, thank you Google Maps, there is still the Rua Synagoga. In other words, Jews have not been present in that land for 530 years, and yet uh, people have kept track of where the old synagogue street was and you see it right here. And not only thank you Google Maps, but thank you Google Street View. You can actually look down the street on Google uh, Maps as well. And uh, there's the old synagogue street. One day we'll all make a pilgrimage to La Coruña and walk the street. Let's, uh, let's get a field trip started there. Uh, now, just uh, three years ago, um, the Bodleian Library agreed to return after 500 years plus to return the Kennecott Bible for a special exhibition in La Coruña. So here is the Guardian newspapers um, page uh, about that. Uh, so uh, it was on a display in its home city where it was created for several months, a wonderful gesture uh, of the Bodleian. And uh, here's uh, our colleague, Elvira Martin Contreras of Madrid, who went to see it. She's seen it in Oxford, but she also went to see it in La Coruña and to see the exhibition and sent me a photo of herself uh, with the Kennecott Bible under glass there. So a really wonderful nod to uh, medieval and modern uh, Britain and the UK and, the UK and, and Spain coming uh, together. There again is the colophon of our scribe. Um, we know of two other works written by Moshe Ibn Zabara. <coughs> Excuse me. One of them is a British Library manuscript of Torah, Haftarot, and Migilot. And here are two images of it, uh, Folio 11R on the right and 103V with the colophon on the left. And the second one that he wrote is in the Sassoon collection, but its location is unknown. I've checked with colleagues at the National Library of Israel here in Jerusalem. They are also unaware of where it's located at the moment. Excuse me. <coughs> and therefore, no photos. Um, the colophon seems to have been added by someone other than Moshe Ibn Zabara. It tells us that this is his name, but the praise for him is so effusive, it's hard to imagine that anybody would say such things about himself with the standard humility so, and the letter writing is a little bit different. So we assume somebody else wrote this information about our scribe. <clears throat> that point aside, we now know that he also wrote this manuscript and the Kennecott Bible and the one uh, whose location is still unknown. Uh, the name of our artist, Yosef Ben Chaim, this is a complete page. This, look at the size of the letters. These are several centimeters high. Uh, and he writes, Ani Yosef, Ben Chaim Zehasefer Tziarti Behishlamti. I am Joseph, the son of Chaim. This book I illustrated and I completed. And he uses zoomorphic figures to write the Hebrew letters, as we saw earlier in one case. And here's a close up of like just two lines Zehasefer Tziarti. And yes, that is a naked woman right there. As I always tell my students when I teach this, you have one of those in the back of your biblical text somewhere or in your church or synagogue pew or at home, right? Naked woman and all sorts of creatures, a seal and a human and a rabbit and a snail and another <clears throat> quasi naked person here and buttocks showing how much fun can you have writing a colophon or drop, 
drawing a colophon. Yosef Ben Chaim did it, okay? And you see the whole page right here. Uh, he actually wrote out on the opposite side uh, what he wanted to write. You see the words there on the right, and then used that as the guide for a full page of artwork that you see here, but he wrote out the letter. So he had a, a little uh, guide to guide him as he worked on the artwork. And here are again, some of those zoomorphic letters that we saw earlier, which he has now you know, incorporated into the colophon. <clears throat> How did the Kennecott Bible come to be? A work like this is not created ex nihilo. It doesn't just one day, some genius says, I'm gonna create this. It has to have antecedents, and that's what I wanna show you. The Severa Bible, written in 1300 in Severa, now in the Bibliothèque Nacional de Portugal in Lisbon, is the model for the Kennecott Bible. Written 176 years earlier, this is the first page. Look familiar, right? Uh, this is where Cervera is in northeastern Spain in Catalonia. If you compare the two pages of the Cervera Bible and the Kennecott Bible, you see that the, the one on the left served as the model for the one on the right. Not just because of this, but because of other things. Parasha artwork. More parasha. No, sorry, this is the end of Jeremiah and the start of Ezekiel. <clears throat> Jonah being swallowed by the big fish with the mariners looking on. This beautiful menorah, which comes uh, in the book of Zechariah. Right. So very similar artwork. Although I have to say this is the most stunning piece. The Kennecott Bible has a menorah, but it doesn't come close to the beautiful piece that you see here in the Severa Bible. Uh, what do we know about the Severa Bible? Well, it's worth a sidebar comment, even though we're going to come back to Kennecott, because this is really fascinating. We know the name of the scribe, Shmuel ben Avraham. He gives us the place, uh, I wrote it in Severa. And he tells us more. Not only does he tell us the date he completed the task of writing this manuscript, but to our great fortune, he gives us the date for when he began the writing of this manuscript. And if you convert the Jewish dates, if you look in the text box on the left, this corresponds to the 30th of July, 1299 for the start date, and the 19th of May, 1300 for the end date. It's rare that we get this kind of information. In the Kennecott Bible, all we know is when he completed it. How long did it take to write the Kennecott Bible? We won't know. But how long did it take to write this Cervera Bible? Almost 200 years earlier, we do know exactly how long it took. And the best part is, by the way, he says, uh, I did this while I was recovering from my broken leg. Okay, so our, our scribe Shmuel has a broken leg. And, you know, for these number of months, he sits down and writes the exquisite Cervera Bible. So here it is, and let's do the calculations, uh, which I have done uh, 294 days from start to finish. You subtract 53 days for every Shabbat and the festival days, um, <clears throat> Pesach, etc. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Pesach all would have fallen in there. So we had 241 working days if you worked six days a week uh, to write 451 folios, about two folios per day which more or less makes sense. And that more or less what you would think uh, such a work would take. And there we have confirmation of it uh, from the colophon. This is the artist colophon, which drew out the uh, zoomorphic letters, but somehow never got colored in. So this obviously is the model for the Kennecott Bible uh, as well. And similarly, they both have the cow for the beginning of the so-called red heifer section. And the Severa Bible is also digitized at uh, the World Digital Library, which is a major project um, headed up by the Library of Congress, but with support from UNESCO. Now, if you know your geography, and I showed you this before, wait a minute, Cervera is way over here, and La Coruña is way up there. How did the scribe of the Kennecott Bible and the artist of the Kennecott Bible know the Severa Bible? Well, we know the answer to that question as well. 
Uh, we have ownership notes on the blank pages at the end of the Severa Bible. And it turns out that the Bible was owned by a man named David Mordechai living in La Coruña in 1375, which means even though it was written in Severa in 1300, 75 years later, that Bible has been moved to La Coruña. And we will assume, and I can show you that, that it was still there 100 years later when the Kennecott Bible was written. So this is 1375 ownership note. Here's our word, Ba Coruña in Coruña. And jump forward 50 or so years in 1439, another ownership note tells us that it's still in the family of David Mordechai in the year 50, 5199. Um, and here it is corresponding to 1439. Uh, the last ownership note, it's 1517, but it's now in Constantinople. No surprise, with the expulsion of Iberian Jewry, their Severa Bible moves across the Mediterranean. Here's our handy map of the Sephardic diaspora, including all the way to Constantinople, Istanbul in the far uh, right of the map. But of course, some Iberian exiles didn't go that far. If you look at the text box on the left, they just went across to North Africa, and you'll see why that's important in just a second. The Kennecott Bible is totally online uh, at the Bodleian um, uh, website, and um, uh, this is all um, available for anybody who wants to inspect this on their own after my presentation this evening. Why is it called the Kennecott Bible? Let's end with the story of how it comes to Oxford. Benjamin Kennecott was a great Hebraist, famous, his works are still used today, 200 plus years, 250 years later. Uh, he was librarian of the then newly built Radcliffe camera in Oxford, and he purchased this in 1771. Here is the Radcliffe camera, <coughs> iconic uh, photo of central Oxford. Those of you who know the city, this is the Bodleian Quad, and the, Rad, <clears throat> the Rad, Radcliffe camera right here. Um, Kennecott purchased it in the following way, or how did it come to Britain to begin with? Patrick Chalmers was a Scottish merchant in Gibraltar, which by then was a British colony. And he bought the Bible there. So that Jewish community that left Iberia and went to North Africa, what is today Morocco, Algeria, had apparently crossed back into that little British colony of Gibraltar, which has always had since it became a British colony, a very important Jewish community. And Chalmers, the Scottish merchant in Gibraltar, bought the Bible there from whom we do not know, but a Jew, obviously, in that community. Uh, Chalmers entrusted it to William Maul, the first Earl of Panmore, and this is the ancestral estate of the Earl of Panmore. He, in turn, sold it to Kennecott in 1771 for, are you ready? 52 pounds, 10 shillings, approximately 9,000 pounds today. I don't want to say that any of us could afford 9,000 pounds to buy a manuscript, but I think if the Kennecott Bible were available today for 9,000 pounds, we would find the way to buy it. Or if even if we took up the collection plate just from the several dozens of us who are with together this evening, we could buy it back in 1771. Today, of course, it has no value. It is beyond uh, value because of its importance. So that's how it comes to Oxford as Kennecott brings it there and it resides uh, at the Bodleian Library uh, at Hayom Hazeh until this day, actually in the Western Library across Broad Street. And here's a picture of um, Cesar Nershan Haman, the, many of you know him, the Hebraic librarian in Oxford, and myself uh, treating ourselves to yet another inspection of this remarkable book. So when I showed you uh, the size of it, I promised you could see it compared to a human. You, you saw uh, Elvira in La Coruña with the volume, and now you see Cesar and I to give you a sense of the size of it. That picture I showed you before opened up to uh, the beginning of Jonah. Uh, if you can't buy the Kennecott Bible anymore, it's not for sale, uh, what you can do is obtain the facsimile edition. 
And I'm happy that I saw um, uh, Linda and Michael uh, Falter of London, whose company Facsimile Editions produces these incredible, uh, just absolutely um, sumptuous reproductions. And uh, they are on the, um, the Zoom with us this evening. So thank you for joining us. So here is your opportunity to buy the facsimile edition of the most exquisite of all Hebrew Bibles, as it says on the bottom, the crown jewel of all medieval Hebrew manuscripts. And it's available for 8,000, a little bit under uh, 8,000 pounds. So, or you can purchase single leaves if you notice right here, okay? So um, having the, uh, uh, the, the, the availability to turn the page, look, we live in a world where we have digital access to it, fantastic, but there's nothing like holding the manuscript in your hand, as I have had the honor and privilege to do, or turning the pages of the facsimile, which is literally exactly like uh, the original, and I have held the facsimile in my hands uh, as well. Uh, so there you can, there you have this manuscript. It is absolutely, I think you will all agree with me, nothing surpasses it. It is the greatest Bible ever written. And the only word we can say, as I conclude before our Q&A, is toda, not just to you for joining us this evening, but to all of the people who've been involved in the journey of the Kennecott Bible from its origins in 1476, 16 years before the expulsion of the Jews in 1492. A remarkable tribute to the great medieval Spanish community, Spanish Jewish community, even in the decades before its expulsion under Ferdinand and Isabella. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. That was fantastic. And it's a beautiful Bible. And I've I've always known about the Kennecott Bible and you know I've seen it and but I've I've never never had someone present it to me in such a fantastic way. Wonderful. Thank Wonderful. you, Gary. Thank, Thank you. you. Um just to make a if I may make a comment, we do have some ketubot in the Cairo Geniza that have human and animal drawings but we've not looked at their paleography to know if they're in fact from spain or from another place so um it, it's very rare as gary said to ever have human figures in manuscripts from islamic countries yeah so um that's everyone from the audience if i may take up one more minute to ask one question before before we finish um the the counts of um inside the parasha markers i've never I, i've looked at many many bibles i've never seen is that unique to the kennecott bible or is that more have i just missed them by not paying attention to them and now you're asking me because i don't remember are they in the severa bible which is the model i don't think ah, they're. that's they a good question their, that's a good question i don't think they're in their severa bible yeah. uh and i don't know i've not seen this in another one but this is the i mean uh, people who work with manuscripts astara uh vince um, and others who are joining us, uh, you know, we the the estimate is eighty thousand medieval Hebrew manuscripts are extant. I think that's the estimate that Malachi Beit uh, that's the figure he uses. And you know, we're lucky to study in up close and personal ten or twenty of them in our lifetime, right? Because you just you can't study all eighty thousand unless you are Professor Beit who probably has studied all of them the, the uh, man who created the field of, of uh, study of Hebrew manuscripts, um, along with Colette Sirot in Paris. But uh, yeah, you'd have to spend a lot of time doing this. You'd have to spend a lot of time working through these. And fortunately, we live in a world where there's more and more of these are available to us now in digital format, but there is nothing like holding the manuscript in your hand no. to have the tactile, uh, sense sensation and the olfactory sensation and you just see things by turning a page after a while you got to get out away from your computer screen as you know on the other hand the computer screen which allows you to zoom in on things and i've picked up on little you know things on the digital images because you can you know get down to the granular level and see things which you wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye so you need to have both of those experiences but yes we got to keep studying all these things at star well, thank you so much, Gary. This is this was a fantastic 
fantastic talk. Um, so we will be sending around details of the next um, talk by email. So please keep your eyes peeled for that. And I believe that's all for tonight. Um, thank you again, Gary, for, for dedicating your time and for the fantastic questions, everybody. Um, and I look forward to seeing you guys soon for the Oxford Interfaith Forum. So goodbye. Thank you again, Taya. Thank you again, Astara. Bye.